Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel Airbus uh, What's It Doing Now and uh, I want to talk to you today about uh, SLS uh, which is a satellite um, or satellite uh, landing system or SBAS which is the uh, satellite based uh, augmentation system. Now SLS will be something you might already be uh, familiar with. It's relatively new uh, to, um, uh, to, to the Airbus, it's, it's relatively new to, uh, to us uh, at, uh, at our company. Um, there's lots of information available about this and will be uh, sent to you through your own company at Manual Suite. But I thought it'd be a really good idea to have a look at this and uh, just have a look at some of the background about it, why we actually uh, use it, why it's safer than a conventional sort of RNAV approach, and uh, look at some of the uh, the background about it, look at uh, how it works, uh, what it looks like, and basically how uh, how we use it. Um, bit of a government health warning with this, I'll come on to this more uh, a little bit later on in the video, but do please check your company operations manuals, and particularly your Ops B, as to how your company wants you to uh, fly the SLS. Now the SLS is not to be confused with um, FLS, uh, which is a non-precision uh, approach, um, uh, but, but still essentially it looks like an ILS, uh, but it's used for NDB, VOR uh, approaches. Uh, but essentially the difference with FLS, um, I'm not even too sure if it's been approved yet, but the, with FLS, it's still uh, barometric. It uses basically an anchor point to draw a path, but it's still a barometric based approach, whereas SLS is satellite based. Uh, so very different, uh, but uh, yeah, more, more of that uh, in a moment. So anyway, um, it basically enables us to fly RMP approaches very in a very similar format and, and process uh, as as you would fly an ILS. The presentation, which I'll show you in just a few a few moments' time, um, I've got some clips of what the PFD actually looks like. But essentially, allows us to fly an ILS uh, type approach um, with deviation bars and the lock and the glide slope, and even the FMAs are the same, uh, but to be used for an RMP approach. It critically removes the barometric profile okay uh, by replacing it with a geometric path all built for all built uh, by the satellites and the aircraft's MMR uh, I'll, I'll talk to you more about that in, in just a moment now we're all familiar aren't we with the risks of barometric approaches barometric RMP approaches I covered this in a, the Paris incident which happened um, uh, recently uh, fairly recently uh, where the incorrect uh, Q and H was set. Uh, everything in the flight deck looked uh, as broadly as it should, uh, and it, it events, uh, the event um, uh, was um, well um, covered uh, and highlighted the risks of, of barometric approach and not setting the right Q and H for an RNAV, RNAV uh, approach. I've covered that in a previous video. I'll see if I can put a link in here for you. So, like I say, government health warning with this. Please check your company SOP. Please check your aircraft equipment because not all aircraft will have SLS. Um, check how your company gives you this information because it might be that this stuff is available on new aircraft fits or new FMS fits. Um, I'm not too sure if Honeywell or Thales, whether the two actually, uh, are, are you both actually able to um, um, fly these approaches in the FMGC flight uh, flight guidance or to flight guidance software. Um, but anyway, check your aircraft, check your company, check how your company's giving you this information. It might be this only on new aircraft fits. It might be that they plan to retrofit it. Uh, it might be at the end of your operational flight plan, uh, or or it might be uh, a standard part of your operate your ops uh, procedure, or it might come into another technical manual, uh, depending on how your company decides to get you that information. Uh, and again, check your charts, uh, but I'll talk to you more about that uh, in a minute. And also your minima, whether you use LPV minima or whether you use LNAV and VNAV. As far as we're concerned, we use the LNAV VNAV minima. Um, uh, but again, that might be slightly different to you, so to, to do check that. So anyway, let's have a look and, and see how this works and how we're able to get this geometric path, which removes the necessity for 
uh, barometric profile. We're all familiar with uh, GNSS, okay? Uh, the 24, I think, satellites, correct me if I'm wrong, that are buzzing around the Earth in a relatively low orbit. Uh, orbit. And um, we use these satellites for position fixing um, and uh, GPS primary, obviously, is our primary source of navigation. And also, these things are you know, pretty accurate and allows us to then fly these RMP, uh, RMP approaches and various other things. The thing that's unique about um, SBAS is that it removes this thing called ionospheric uh, error. And it's a grid of ground-based satellites. I'll see if I've got a, a photograph here for you. Um, yeah, sorry, ground-based stations and what they call, I won't get too technical on this, geostationary satellites. Now, geostationary, by the nature of its name, they sit stationary and they rotate at the same speed as the, as the Earth. You see these on weather satellites, you see these on TV satellites. Your satellite dish will be pointing uh, towards um, one of these uh, satellites pointing south, uh, typically for us here in the UK. Uh, and uh, these things just sit in a fixed space, uh, point in space. They communicate then with these um, uh, ground um, equipment. Uh, this ionospheric sort of error, if you like, calculated error, is then sent to these geostationary satellites. That is then sent, this signal, this correction signal, if you like, is sent to the aircraft via the MMR, which is a multi-mode receiver, and that's the thing that calculates the deviation of the glide slope uh, and the uh, localizer. Now, those ground uh, satellites, uh, or so those geostationary satellites and ground-based equipment in Europe is called uh, EGNOS. That stands for the European Geostationary Navigation Overlay service bit of a mouthful isn't it but anyway if you in case you're wondering what egnos meant uh, that's what it is so it's those a group of ground stations and the geostationary satellites that are correcting for the ionospheric error which is then sent um uh, to the uh, aircraft uh, error signal and that enables us then to uh, fly these ILS like approaches uh, geometric uh, profile uh, to to our minima um, yeah so obviously of your, your approach chart needs to have uh, EGNOS um, on uh, on clearly displayed on the chart amongst other things we'll come on to uh, in just a moment so what does it look like well can, I've got a picture of a PFD uh, up here for you it's almost identical uh, to an ILS. You still have lock and glide slope on the lateral and vertical uh, of the FMA. Um, you still have your localizer and glide path deviation bars. Um, when you select the autopilots, you'll get approach one uh, in the landing category, which you'd normally have cat one, cat two, cat three. Uh, it'll say uh, approach one, and you've just got SLS in the bottom right hand side there. Uh, in mid -change. on the bottom left is just the identifier for that uh, for that type of approach um, so cl quite clever bit of stuff really it looks just like an ILS and we use it in, in an almost an I I identical way except obviously it's an RNAV VNAV uh, RNAV approach with using LNAV uh, VNAV minimum for, for, for us because then that might be slightly different uh, for you so how do we use it? Well, let's check the chart first to make sure that Egnos is uh, clearly uh, displayed. Every time I say Egnos, I think of an alcoholic drink. Um, uh, we use LNAV VNAV minimum, not LVP, but again, uh, check your company. Um, SLS must also be available in the arrivals page in the FMGC. Um, now, when you go to the RADNAV page, uh, it gives the option to deselect SLS if you SLS if you are going to fly FLS. Um, I'm not entirely sure if FLS is approved yet. Again, check your company, but don't de don't deselect that in order to get FLS. Okay, we want to stay uh, with SLS, but if you are flying FLS, that's where you would deselect SLS in order to get FLS. Um, anyway, I'm not going to come on to that now. We're not approved to do it, so uh, we'll, we'll scratch that, but I just thought I'd bring that up because there is there is mention of it in the, in the manuals. Um, how do we fly it? Well, we'll arm the approach in the same way as you would do for an ILS. Um, there's no need to wait for the final approach fix uh, as we would do uh, for an RMP approach. Uh, we arm both autopilots in the conventional way. That's why you'll see approach one in the landing capability. Standard SOP callouts with localizer and glide path deviation. Um, there's no auto land 
uh, with SLS. Although when I did look in the FCOM for autopilot flight director modes uh, for approach, I do believe you still get um, land um, uh, and, and flare, uh, but we don't use it for auto land. Okay, I, I'm 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 going to say I'm about eighty percent sure on that. But uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. You can't auto land with it. It's just you might see those at FMA. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, please. Um, I, I probably am, um, but we can't auto land with it nonetheless. Um, and then localizer and glide slope are conventional, but as I say, the the glide path is a geometric path because we're able to remove those ionospheric errors. Uh, the uh, profile uh, is uh, computed by the FMGC. The MMR receives those signals and is then able to give you an angular displacement on the glide path as a normal glide slope would do, whether you're high or low on that geometric path with the use of this um, GNSS and uh, SBAS, EGNOS, oh, a mouthful of uh, terminology there, uh, system to give us that geometric path, which is um, which, which is what we're looking for to uh, remove the the risk uh, of, of barometric um, uh, errors uh, or a missetting of Q and H, uh, trapping, you know, mitigating those uh, errors uh, by giving us a, a basically a GPS, a full lateral and vertical uh, GPS um, approach. Um, so look, guys, that's that's basically it. Um, uh, I just wanted to cover. Uh, that because uh, I know that that's going to start coming to use more and more, uh, uh, and there's another sort of development um, of uh, of the aircraft equipment and its capability. Um, it's particularly useful for these sort of secondary airports, airports that you know can't or can't can't necessarily warrant having uh, to have install and maintain an ILS. Um, so secondary airports, diversion airports, airports that aren't so busy basically, because it does cost to install and maintain and calibrate uh, an ILS system. So if it's not being used that regularly, the airport will choose not to use it. Also some of the, perhaps the, the Greek islands that are used a lot in the summertime where the weather is very, very good. Um, uh, and, and then uh, perhaps as sort of in the off season, um, that there's, there's, there's never been a need for an ILS because the width is typically good. Uh, but again, in the off season, when things start to deteriorate, um, uh, the, the need for a, a, a lower minimum may be uh, available. And of course, this, this removes the emphasis on the airport uh, to provide accurate guidance to the aircraft and puts the onus then on the uh, aircraft auto flight systems in order to carry out the approach. So again, it's less for responsibility, cost um, and faff uh, for the airport. Not a problem for big airports, uh, big international airports, of course, you know, we're all, we will for the foreseeable have ILS, ILS approaches. But uh, yeah, so there you go, guys. Hopefully uh, that's uh, of use to you. Uh, thanks very much for watching. Uh, keep the plates spinning, stay safe, and I look forward to seeing you again uh, very soon. Thanks very much.